wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show. Dot com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. We love that you're here. We appreciate you because you know what? Deep down, we're just all family, really. It's like a, it's like a the the podcast, the Chris Voss Show podcast is like a snuggly, huggly sort of one of those heavy blankets that you put over you that make you feel all special. You know, it's kind of like a hot cocoa on a winter's morning or a hug from grandma. Uh, if you liked your grandma, I should say, <laughs> uh, it, or it could be both. Uh, there you go. Anyway, guys, <laughs> thanks for tuning in. Having a little bit of improv fun there, uh, to the podcast. We certainly appreciate being here. Of course, youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss is where you can see all the video versions of these interviews i know that the podcast is largely audio but if you just really deep down say i don't believe that he's really talking to a human being it sounds like he is on the podcast but i really want to see that human being that he's talking to and maybe see who chris voss the hell is you can go to youtube.com for says chris voss the service is free right now for an unlimited amount of time you want to rush over there sign up hit that bell notification away you go thecvpn.com for your friends neighbors relatives go to goodreads.com for says chris voss you see all the books i'm reviewing talking about interviewing uh we showcase a lot of books that are on the schedule of two there as well go check that out you can also go to facebook.com for us the the Chris Voss show. There's a bunch of groups on there too. on the Chris Voss show, you can take and follow as well. Thousands, tens of thousands of people over there in those groups, check them out. You can interact with them, et cetera, et cetera. Today we have a most stupendous, brilliant author on, Oh my God, she's written 18 novels. I'm still working on trying to get my first book. She's done 18 novels. Uh, and, uh, yeah, she's got her newest book we're going to be talking about today. The newest book is called Invisible Girl, and it's by the author, the renowned author, I should say, 18 books, Lisa Jewell. She's the number one New York Times bestselling author of 18 novels, including The Family Upstairs, and then She Was Gone, as well as Watching You and I Found You. Her novels have sold more than 4.5 million, we'll go ahead and make that uh, emphasis, copies internationally. So uh, somebody likes reading her books, and her work has been translated into 25 languages. So people all over the world love this author. Uh, Lisa lives in London with her husband and her two daughters. Welcome to the show, Lisa. How are you? I'm, I'm very, very good indeed. How are you doing? Good, 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 good. And you're coming to us from London this morning? Uh, yes, I am. I'm in uh, North London. Um, it's actually evening time here, so it's mm -hmm. dark. Yeah. How's Curtain's How's cold. London these days? Uh, it's dark, of course, as yes. always. I'm sure. Uh, we do have some sunshine in London. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we had loads. In fact, we had loads over the summer. Thank God. Did you really? If ever a summer you wanted sunshine, it was this summer. Um, yeah, yeah, it's fine here. We're just about to go into our second lockdown tomorrow. So. Oh, that's right. Uh, my husband and I are going to go out for our last dinner. Our last supper tonight before they lock all the restaurants up and board board everything up again. Uh, yeah, so it's the end end of the fun for a while, but uh, yeah, it's all good really. You know, I have friends in Australia and they they've beaten their last case and they're clean. So I know, but for how long? <laughs> You've got to let they, somebody in again eventually. I guess they're doing really good, and there's like one or two cases that pop up. I'm not sure how, but. Uh, you know, yeah. therein lies it is. So you've written this amazing novel, Invisible Girl, a novel. Uh, let's give people your plugs so people can go to your dot coms and know where to find the book to purchase as well first. Uh, yes. So my website is lisajewelbooks.com. Um, I am very active on Instagram at Lisa Jewel UK and on Twitter at Lisa Jewel UK. Uh, and I have a Facebook page as well um, called Lisa Jewel. So there you go. You can find me in all those places. There you go. There you go. So you've written 18 novels 
And I, I imagine the 18 includes this one. What made you want to write an 18th one? Uh, well, the contract that I'd signed with my publishers, <laughs> <laughs> in which I promised to write them, <laughs> novel, which was actually on the contract called Book 18, uh, mm -hmm. before it even had a title. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a book a year writer. I've been writing a book a year for 21 years now. So it's not quite a book a year, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and yes, yeah, so Invisible Girl, I could tell you a little bit about how how it came to me. Sure. Um, because no book obviously comes to an author as a fully formed thing. It always comes as some tiny little shred of something that doesn't mean anything to anybody else. But as a weird author with a weird author's brain, you kind of see some potential in it to grow sort of a, a 350 page novel from it. Um, and in the case of this book, um, I was walking through a snowstorm in London, just across the street from where I live about two winters ago. And through the snow and it was 3 30 so all the schools had just come out there was kids everywhere throwing snowballs chucking snowballs at each other and through all of this and the yummy mummies trailing in the wake of these children um this guy was trying to just get down the road um to go to wherever he wanted to go and he just had this air about him he looked lost he looked lonely he looked disappointed he looked like he had some repressed anger. He looked like the kind of guy that gives women the creeps a little bit. Oh. There was just something. He, he wasn't a bad looking guy. There was just something about him that just made me feel uncomfortable for him. Um, and I just had this moment of just thinking, I'd really like to understand what it feels like to be a guy like that, to go through your days just trying your best to be a decent person wishing that you could have a girlfriend, wishing that you could have a social life and friends to go to the pub with, but for some reason that just never happens for you. Um, so that was the moment where I just thought, that's what my, I want my next book to be about. I want it to be about this guy. I don't know what's going to happen to him yet. <laughs> I don't know what the setting for this book is going to be, but it's going to be about him. Um, so I started with him and I gave him the name Owen Pick um, and I made him into a 33-year-old. He's a single guy. Uh, he's in fact he's a virgin um, and he, he bless his heart he's living with his aunt uh, in her spare bedroom on a single bed with a lumpy mattress and uh, his aunt doesn't really like him very much she keeps all the doors in her apartment locked so he can't get into any of the other rooms in the apartment she doesn't let him put the heating on so his room's always cold um, and when we are first introduced to Owen in the first opening chapters he has just been suspended from his job as a college lecturer because two of his students have complained about his behaviour at the college disco, the Christmas disco. Uh, so he comes home from work um, feeling, feeling, feeling furious because he knows he didn't do anything wrong and that these girls are just picking on him. Um, so it really follows him um, as he kind of descends down this black hole of, of bitterness and anger um, and finds himself in um, an incel forum um, and I will probably have to explain what an incel forum is because I'd assumed when I wrote about this topic that most people knew what it was and knew what incels were but I've been surprised by how many people don't actually know what an incel is. An incel uh, is a, a self-identified involuntary celibate i.e. a man a heterosexual man who would like to be sleeping with women and is unable to form relationships or sleep with women um, for reasons unknown to them, but they put it down to social injustice. Um, and they spend a lot of time in forums online um, talking in quite violent terms about women. Um, and there's a lot of misogyny um, that goes on and things that most people really wouldn't want to be party to or think about or read or, or know was happening. Um, so that's Owen. So I'm saying the book is about Owen, but actually the book is called Invisible Girl. So yes. <laughs> there's clearly other people in this book. I was uh, going to ask. I'm like, there's, there's a guy there's here. There's more to it than that. <laughs> yeah. So what I wanted to do with Owen was have him be seen by other people because that's the interesting thing is to be Owen and to see the world from his point of view, but also to see him as other people see him. Um, so there's a character called Kate, who's a physiotherapist, and she lives across the street from Owen with her husband, Rowan, who's a child psychologist, and their two teenage children. And they've only just moved into their apartment. And shortly after they move in, 
her teenage daughter claims that Owen has followed her home from the tube station and was being really creepy and weird. Um, there are also a load of sex attacks happening in the very local area. Um, and Kate, because her daughter claims to have been followed home by Owen, suspects Owen very strongly of having something to do with these sex attacks. Um, because Owen sadly gives Kate the creeps, as Owen gives everybody the creeps. Um, and then the invisible girl herself is a former patient of Kate's husband, Rowan, who's I mentioned as a child psychologist. And um, she um, was having therapy with uh, Rowan from the ages of 12 to 15. He then signs her off and says, you're cured. She'd come to him because she was self-harming because something terrible happened to her when she was 10 years old. Um, and she feels very much that she has not been cured, that he has not got to the nub of what it is that's been making her so unhappy. And she starts following him around um, <laughs> and hiding in the building site across the street and just watching him and finding out that uh, Rowan has some secrets of his own. And the story really takes off when Saffron, is, who is the name, of the, which is the name of the Invisible Girl, Saffron Maddox goes missing from outside Rowan's house at midnight on Valentine's Day. And Owen Pick, who lives opposite, is the last person to see her alive. And everybody suspects that it was him who had something to do with her abduction. So that, in a very, very large, large nutshell, <laughs> is the Invisible Girl. There it is. <laughs> there you go. Um, this is kind of an interesting story. A guy who creeps women out just by, you know, he just has that creep factor. Yeah. It sounds like you described my Tinder profile. Um, oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, it does actually on go one. onto Tinder halfway through the book, but that's, that's a spoiler, so we <laughs> won't go too far down there. <laughs> this is an interesting topic to talk about incels. Uh, I've been just enamored with... I'm not enamored. Maybe that's not the correct word. That sounded kind of weird. I, I've been just struck and just like, what the hell is going on here with incels ever since I believe it was a San Bernardino killer yes. uh, we had here in America who brought yes. incels out and everyone was like, what the f, f you know? Yes. And, um, and I've watched them um, and even young, uh, young males that I know that are reaching like 16 to 20 that are like still virgins at 20. Like, yeah. I'm some of them are my family. I'm still trying to figure them out. And they're just, they didn't have any drive to get driver's licenses. Yes. Uh, they didn't have any, like for me, I, and maybe their parents just make it too comfortable at home. But for me, chasing girls started, I think at like 10 or 11. And we used to call yeah. up girls on those, you know, back then we, I don't know what you guys had, if you guys had these in London, but we had, uh, we had party calls on, on rural phones. So you would share. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so you could get a bunch of girls on. It was kind of like a group chat and you'd have a bunch of guy friends on. You just talk stupid. You, know, you had no idea what you're doing. You're just talking stupid stuff. You know, you're interested in girls, but you don't know why. You just don't know what to do with them either. But you're just so like, you're learning. You're learning on the yeah. job in a way, yeah. aren't you? You're working yeah. out as you go along. And, yeah. I, and I do. Yeah, I don't know what it is. And, and this is, you know, you, you mentioned that. And actually, I hadn't been thinking about that when I wrote about Owen. But I have thought about that in terms of, like you say, other guys I see around. My, I haven't got sons. I've got daughters. But my friend's teenage sons. And I just think, wow, this is really strange. This is a really <laughs> weird phenomenon. And I don't know. You know, there's a theory that it's to do with how much porn they've been able to access. Some of it. the, the Some I, don't, I don't really know. I've never studied it that deeply, but it, it's really interesting to me, the psychology of it. And a lot of them seem to come from this younger era. And it yeah, may be definitely. the porn and their access to the Internet. It may be because they don't have strong male role models who've said, you know, you need to do this. Um, I, I think a lot of it's just convenience, too. A lot of the kids are spoiled. And so their parent, like, I remember asking a bunch of them, I'm like, why don't you have a driver's license? Like, yeah. I could not wait. I was going to yes. murder somebody to get my driver's license at 16. Yeah, like yeah. I, you, wanted to, you wanted that ticket. Yeah, that, yeah. That, but my, yeah. my parents were good people, but they made home life such a hell. Just, Ooh. I mean, you're just, you're a teenager. You don't want to be around your parents. I mean, they're not cool. Yeah. Having and, said that, my husband, who's 55, so very much of, a, of a, an older generation, his parents really, really let him and his brother do whatever they wanted. And they didn't, my husband didn't leave home till he was 31. Well, good for you. <laughs> but 
in that period of time, he had plenty of girlfriends and traveled yeah. the world and did all I mean, these sorts yeah. of things as well. And he had a driver's license. I mean, <laughs> I I loved women and chase girls. Like, I just don't get it. Like, from the time I hit puberty, I and and finally learned, okay, oh, this is girls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, I was after them and chasing them. And then what kills me about some of these incels is they spend so much time in those forums. And you're just like, you know, if you put this amount of time into yeah. not only learning to talk to women and yeah. and how to engage them, uh, you know, I, even I had to get a book on how to better date women and how to have conversations with them and talk to them. Well, you're actually very much describing Owen Pick's narrative arc in the book. Yeah. And I can't go into too much detail because okay. it's kind of a spoiler, but that is very much he, he gets to an incredibly low point. He meets this incel in a pub in London who attempts to radicalize him and get him to do something unthinkable oh, wow. in the in the name of their their cause um and it's kind of a turning point and i i had kind of known with owen that i was going to put him in this situation i was going to get him to meet someone who would try and radicalize him and i didn't know until i was writing it whether i was going whether he would become radicalized or not mm. um or whether he would have that moment like you like you just said of just thinking hold on instead of spending all this time talking to to sad angry men in a forum how about i go on tinder and like you know yeah <laughs> see if there's someone there who might actually just like me for myself if i can just drop all this anger and all this weirdness i've yeah. been carrying yeah. around with me for various reasons um so yeah that is kind of the, the arc that owen goes on a story of secrets and injustices. Invisible Girl evaluates how we look in the wrong places for the bad people and how yes. real predators walk among us in plain sight. Uh, you know, it is interesting. I've seen the creep factor go on. Like mm. one of the things I always had with uh, uh, in the companies that I own, we'd have to write, write people up for sexual harassment. And I would usually as a CEO be uh, dealing with that job because it was sensitive and and it was an issue and I had to deal with it powerfully. Um, and so I would usually be the one to sit down and write up the sexual harassment thing. And a lot of times, 90% of the time, it was guys who didn't understand their, their, their own creep factor. Yeah. And uh, they couldn't understand why they couldn't act like some of the guys who were hot running around the office that the girls exactly. were with. And they're like, well, I saw, you know, Brad Pitt dude putting his arm around her and she didn't complain. So I figured yeah. it was fine for me. And exactly. And so uh, I kind of identify with some of what you've written in the book and in, in that way of, of, cause I would yeah. have to talk to him and they wouldn't be able to no, understand. Because that's the thing. There's so many things that Owen does in the book, but if somebody else did it, mm -hmm. nobody would misread it or think anything bad of him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's moments at the beginning that what, what he actually gets um, suspended from his job for is sweating on girls at the school disco. Oh, wow. You know, um, which if he was like sexy, hot teacher that all the girls had a crush on, they, they would probably be like, oh, he sweated on me. Um, <laughs> because it's creepy, um, creepy Owen Pick, it's just a straight to the, to, to the principal to complain about being harassed. Um, and yeah, there are so many things he does that are just, they're just a, like a tiny degree off a tiny degree off he's not going around doing bad things but because of the way he presents it and like you say that unawareness of his own creep factor he thinks he can get away with behaving in a certain way and he can't and it's it's really sad it is really really sad but being that it's a novel written by a novelist he has an arc so worth reading just to find out find out um, what happens at the end yeah exactly so um without giving away the ending you can dodge this question if you want uh, what what do you hope maybe readers take away from the book if that doesn't give away the ending? Yeah, well, it uh, yeah, I mean, it is. It's clearly, as you said, it's a book about injustices, um, and it 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 is really hard to talk about because, as much as during the book, you're never you're pretty sure that Owen hasn't done the thing that he's being accused of doing. The possibility is still there because he's such a he's the sort of guy who could do it. And I never want the reader to lose sight of the fact that he is the sort of guy who could do it. But because we're seeing things from his perspective, you kind of know he didn't, but you've got yeah. a question mark the whole time. And I suppose that's just that's just the thing to take away from it is, you know, why do we form 
these prejudices against people? What is it about people um, that makes gives us these these really visceral responses? Um, and yeah, just to, and and also on the other side of the street, you've got the Fours family. You've got Rowan, Kate, and their two teenage children. And you can make the same wrong assumptions about them, that they are your classic middle class professional family and everything must be fabulous for them and everything must be good in their lives. And they're good people, a physiotherapist and a psychologist, a yeah, child psychologist, they must be good people. Um, so you can make the, the wrong assumptions about people in that way as well. So it is just about questioning the way you assume things about people. It is interesting how we do that. I was watching, uh, there was a video that I saw this morning, actually. It was a paralyzed uh, 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 pool jumping, that's not the right word, diving, a diving instructor who uh, had been like this huge diving instructor and instructed a lot of people and helped them uh, to become like, you know, divers. I don't know if Olympic, but, you know, people, extraordinary uh, talent. And he gotten a cancer that had uh, made him paralyzed um, down his left side. And so he can't walk very well. He can do anything. But once a year, every year on his birthday, he goes up and does a dive. And it was interesting to watch because at first when I saw him in his state that he's in, unfortunately, with being paralyzed, my brain went, ooh, that's oh, awful bad. Mm. And, and, I, I, and I thought in my head, you can't think of people that way because he's, he's a human being. There's still a functioning brain in his head. His motor skills are not working. You can't evaluate people that way. And then I started thinking, you know, what's interesting is I form this perception. Why do I form that perception? And, uh, <clears throat> and you know, I think some of it comes from our DNA. We, we look at people and we evaluate them in our life. We evaluate whether babies are healthy or whether they're not. There's, I think there's something kind of in us, but unfortunately we go down some bad roads, which is an interesting place that you took this book on people's evaluations or perceptions and why they yeah. form them and, and how they can be malformed. Well, absolutely. And there's, a, and in fact, Invisible Girl herself, Saffron Maddox, who is, I, I write her as this extraordinarily beautiful young woman. And she talks a lot about how everybody assumes that her life must be good just because she's pretty. And nobody looks beneath the surface of her, of her physical attractiveness to, to find out if there's something painful inside her. Um, so yeah, it works. It works in so many different ways, and I think yeah, you, you're probably right. It probably is in our DNA because you know basically the, the the reason why people find people attractive is because the features that attractive people have signify good health and good genetics. Uh, so therefore, you don't need to worry about them because that person is in good health and has good genetics, um, and that's why you'd want to you know, make babies with someone who's physically attractive because then you'll have healthy babies with good genetics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, it is in our DNA, but we, we've we evolved beyond that point now. Um, we should be able to override those instinctive <laughs> feelings we have that are buried in our, in, in, in our genetics and, you know, dig a little deeper with people to find out what, what's really going on. After uh, Black Lives Matter came out, I did an experiment and I started... Everywhere, every time I left the house and went to like the store or something, I would look at faces, especially people from minorities, and I would, I would, I would be very conscious of, at looking at them and go, "Okay, so what did you just assume there, buddy?" Yeah. And uh, and then I would think, "Why did you make that choice?" And does that person look violent? Does that person look angry? Does he look like he's dangerous? And of course, we do that for not only what you mentioned for breeding, but we do it for you know, is this person approaching Personal me? Personal safety, yes. Me? A danger yeah. to me um so did the characters that were in invisible girl did they come to you at once fully formed or did they develop over time uh well yeah i mean clearly had he was already in my head a long time before i sat down to write the book um but so that's how i tend to always start with one person who i want to write about um but then i i can never tell a story from one point of view i always need to find out I need to see what's happening from multiple points of view so that I can, because I don't plan my novels, so that I can see what's happening as it's happening. Um, and I also jump around in time frames and what have you sometimes as well. Um, and sometimes I have a third person voice and a first person voice, as is the case in Invisible Girl. So I had Owen and then I knew that I wanted him to be seen by someone. And I just had this idea of this sort of unhappily married woman, again, 
who on the surface looks like she's got everything. She's got the handsome, successful husband, the two children, the beautiful apartment. Um, and yeah, so Kate came to me as I started writing the book as the person who wanted, I, I thought if someone's going to see Owen, they should be living opposite Owen. That's the best place to see him. Um, and Saffron came really late in the day, actually, because I hadn't planned to write her into the story. It had just been, it was going to be just this playoff between Kate and Owen and their, their prejudices and assumptions about each other. Um, and then I just wrote this throwaway line about Kate going through her husband's private documents about his patients and finding the paperwork about this young girl called Saffron Maddox and um, realising immediately that she shouldn't have been looking at it. But as I wrote her name and what she was being treated for, I suddenly had all these questions spiral into my head of like, Saffron Maddox, she sounds really interesting. And she was a patient of Rowan's. What must that have been like? What was her therapy like? Um, why was she there? What happened to her when she was 10 years old? Why was she self-harming? Where does she live? What does she look like? Blah, 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 blah. So I suddenly had this head full of questions about her. So I thought the best thing to do is to start writing her. So I immediately went to the next chapter and introduced her as the third character. So then I had my trio of people all sort of circling the same the same issue and the same story in the same location. Some readers went like this. Where, where's the location of the book set in? Oh, yeah. Uh, readers might like this. It's interesting because um, most of my novels are set in London. Every now and then I get bored of London and set my novels somewhere completely different, usually in fictional fictional places because I can't be bothered to go and travel and research the area <laughs> and I'm just too worried that if I set a novel somewhere where I've never lived that I'm going to get it all wrong and I'm going to get complaints from people who actually live there that I've done it wrong um, but this one is set in um, a really beautiful area of North London it's not far from where I live it's only about a 20 minute walk from where I live but it's like another universe I live on the side of a massive great big highway um, kind of you know crisscross streets what have you um it's called Hampstead and it's a it's a village it's an old London village London was originally lots and lots of tiny villages um that all got connected as the motor car developed and um it's just this beautiful rambling village with cobbled streets and churches and there's the Hampstead Heath um which is like two square miles of just green open wild space um yeah so that's where it's set and it's beautiful it's a really really beautiful area and it was fun to write about and it's sort of i always have house envy when i walk around there and i look at the mansions and i'm saying how the hell do people afford to live here i don't understand uh, so it was fun to be able to set some something there in that location that's interesting so um with the incel community, how did you go researching the incel community? I mean, that yeah. was an interesting I, well, I, thing. I kind of didn't like yourself. Like you said, you know, when you found out about it, you were immediately fascinated. And you, I'm assuming that if you ever see a headline or read it or there's a documentary, you would probably make a beeline for it and think that's going to be interesting because interesting because I find that whole concept fascinating. And it was the same for me. I'd already, you know, there was a very famous article um, that went um, viral online a couple of years ago called The Rage of the Incels by Gia Tolentino, American uh, journalist who spent lots of time on incel forums. She in infiltrated them uh, anonymously, spent lots of time and came back with the, uh, with, with the shocking truth about what happens on these forums. And then there was a documentary on Netflix uh, earlier in the year uh, called... Uh, I can't remember, but it was about incels. And uh, so, yeah, anytime there's something out there, I'll read it because mm -hmm. it's dark and it's peculiar and it's unsettling. Um, and I love anything that's dark and peculiar and unsettling. So I didn't have to do any research. It was already in my head, kind of primed and ready to go. The only thing I did do was to go onto Wikipedia just to, because there's a lot of terminology. In, you know, most online communities have their own terminology, their own language. Um, which I wasn't familiar with. So I did go on to Wikipedia and just familiarise myself with the, the special short, shorthand um, and the terminology that they use. Um, but no, apart from that, I, did, I didn't have to get my hands dirty <laughs> myself. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, 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 could, I mean, I probably could have stomached it, but I also, I'm, I'm terrible once I start kind of researching things. I just get so easily sucked down 
for hours and hours and hours. Um, mm. You know, like this whole thing that happened with the Wayfair, the, the Wayfair conspiracy. They said that they were child trafficking in these cabinets that they were selling on Wayfair. I thought that doesn't sound right. I'd like to find out more about that. I, I ended up spending three hours just in these weird forums and these weird chat rooms with all these conspiracy theorists. Um, so for me, it's probably best just to keep away from doing research because it just sucks up so much of my time. And the insult community, I'm sorry. Guys, spend yes. less time in the community and just go talk to girls. And Absolutely. It's a numbers yeah. game. You know, read, you... Owen's, read Owen Pick's story. If there's any insults <laughs> there listening to this, read Owen Pick's story and, uh, yeah, be inspired. Like a couple of them, like, I asked a girl out once and she said, no, I'm scarred for life. And you're like, yeah. dude, yeah, <laughs> keep I <know>. asking. <laughs> I know. There seems to be some entitlement to it, too. And like I said, it's a lot of these spoiled kids that everything is given to them. Their parents, you know, seem yeah. to take care of them and everything. You know, I, I see they're not getting their driver's license. And I'm like, why don't you have a driver's license? They're like, because mom and dad are, are my chauffeurs. They'll drive me anywhere I want. So I don't yes. need a car. And I'm like, well, they don't even go out. So why do yeah, they need to drive? Because yeah. they just spend the whole time in their bedrooms. On the yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll right. live at home forever because their parents <laughs> make it. My parents were good people, but they made life at home a living hell. Yeah. So I wanted to get the hell out. I mean, I think most of us from that generation were like, we're out of here, man. It's yes, absolutely. Get me out the door. So yeah. uh, pretty interesting. Um, on your novels, uh, you usually involve plenty of drama, but you made a big transition from contemporary fiction to suspense recently. What inspired your transition, and was this the goal that you were trying to go across? Um, yeah, so I, I, I've been writing since... I started writing my first novel in 1995, uh, in my 20s, and that was purely because of where I was at that point in my life. Uh, how young I was I'd just gone into a new relationship and I was madly in love and life I just spent you know as a pre-children spent my whole life in the pub blah 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 ended up writing this really lovely romantic comedy about flatmates in South London having curry and getting stoned and all that sort of business um, <laughs> and so that was called Rouse Party and that came that was published uh, in the UK in 1999 and was a massive bestseller so that was my debut novel and it went straight to the top of the charts and it was a bit of a phenomenon. Um, and of course, once you've delivered a bestseller to your publishers, they kind of would like some more of the same. So even though that wasn't necessarily my own kind of, you know, that's, that, that's not the sort of genre I read in. I've always enjoyed dark, darker books, real life crime, um, thrillers, um, suspense, what have you. Um, I just that's what I did so for sort of six six or so my first six or so books were all these kind of like rom, rom, contemporary romance but with like edge and you know yeah people took drugs and swore and all that sort of business <laughs> um and then I kind of got older I had a couple of kids went into my 30s couldn't keep writing those books anymore and actually luckily for me at about the same time as I started wanting to do more than just write about cute relationships um and my sales dropped off a bit and that for a writer who's been selling at quite a high level was quite high profile was quite an it was a really good opportunity for me to start experimenting a little bit and seeing if I could you know just sort of move distance myself slightly without anybody throwing their hands up in horror and saying no 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 we want more of the cute romances um, so I started writing more, um, kind of family dramas, I suppose, families with dark secrets at their hearts, um, that sort of thing. So that was the next, I guess, five or six novels were more in that genre. Uh, and then I think it must've been about my 12th novel. I killed, I killed one of my characters kind of cause I was bored halfway through the novel. I was bored and I went back and wrote a prologue, uh, in which I killed one of the main characters um, and then she was dead. And then I thought, okay, now I'm going to have to you know, try and explain to the reader why she died and who killed her. Um, and once you've done that, once you've done that, there's no turning back really. Um, so ever since then, all of my novels have involved some sort of, you know, de deadly peril for my characters. <laughs> um, and yeah, 
they, they're not crime. My novels are not crime novels. I keep my police as far away from crime scenes as I possibly can because I don't know anything about police procedure. I don't have detectives in my books, um, apart from very much in the background. Um, I let my characters do all the detective work in my books. Um, so, so, yeah, and here I find myself with my 18th novel. Um, and uh, I, I appear to be a psychological thriller writer. I didn't ever deliberately set out to do that, but I've been lucky enough in my career, the way it's unfurled, that I've found myself in this position because this is my favourite genre. I'm writing books in my favourite genre. There you Great go. To do. <laughs> well, this is awesome. You've been very successful at it. Uh, is is uh, Do you have a favourite book out of any ones that you've uh, taken written? Of my own books? Uh, yeah, so I've got... Um, I'd say that of my from my romance um, period, uh, there's a book called Vince and Joy, which I absolutely love. Um, it's kind of like a it's a bit it's a bit like a bit of a sliding doors thing about a couple who just miss each other and then keep missing each other and then they finally get together at the end. But it's I, I it, I've got a really big soft spot for it. Uh, and then from the family dramas, there's a book called The House We Grew Up In, which is about a mother with, of four children who has obsessive compulsive hoarding disorder uh, and the impact that that has on her family. And then they have to go to the house after she's died and get rid of her hoard and blah, blah, blah. You can, you can imagine the rest. Um, and then I guess from the thrillers, well, you always kind of, I'm sure you know this from talking to writers. They always like their, their their newest one best because it's the one that you know you're you're completely focused on it. It's your newest baby. It's all you talk about. It's all you think about. So I shall say for now, uh, Invisible Girl. But if you talk to me about my next one, it will be my next one. Do uh, do you see this uh, the characters in this novel continuing, or is the next? Are you what are you working on next? Definitely, I'm definitely not going to revisit this one. I've only ever written one sequel before, and that was a sequel to my first novel, Ralph's Party, which was called After the Party. And I wrote it because I thought my publishers would like it, um, which was a lesson lesson to myself: is don't ever write a book that you think somebody else will like. Only write a book that you think you will write like. And I regretted writing that sequel. And ever since I've said I'm never going to write another sequel, but actually I will write a sequel to the book that came out before this, which is called The Family Upstairs. And I'm going to write that sequel because I want to write it, not because I think anybody else wants me to write it. Um, and certainly with this, I've got no interest in revisiting these characters. Their story is done. They're finished. They're, 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 they're gone. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm kind of 70,000 words, which is almost a whole book, although it doesn't quite feel like it to me yet which is a bit worrying, into my 19th novel. So my wow. novels are probably about 90,000 words. So I should be really feeling like I'm coming to the end, but I've got this horrible feeling it's going to be a really big fat book because I'm 70,000 words in and it still feels like it's the middle of the book. <laughs> wow. Maybe it'll <laughs> yeah, be a magnum so, opus. It'll be well, yeah, God, I don't know. I'm not a fan of long books myself. So uh, well, well, we'll see. Maybe it'll all suddenly come together in the next 20,000 words. Uh, and that is called The Night She Disappeared. Um, and it's again, it's another missing teenage girl, but a very different setting and a very different um, concept. Uh, and that comes out next year. So you have something <laughs> against teenage girls? Is that why they're always missing? I, I, I honestly, <laughs> I just, yeah. And then then she was gone, which is my big New York Times bestseller, the one that's been in in the in the top three for about six months or whatever. Um, that's about a missing teenage girl as well. So. Mm. I clearly do. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's being the mother of teenage girls. Maybe I'm just sort of living out my worst fears through my books. I don't know. <laughs> I, the next one is not going to have any missing teenage girls in it, I promise. Well, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe your fan base loves that. And it creates an interesting <laughs> suspense and drama. So yes. that's what people yes, tune in for. Right? There yeah. you go. Uh, anything more we should know about Invisible Girl and what you're doing before we uh, head off? Uh, no, I think... Um, I think I gave a pretty, pretty um, complete pricey of it earlier on in our chat. And we've, we've talked about it at some length. Um, but I would say that uh, if you are the sort of reader who likes a book where the pages turn themselves and you, a, I always call the, these sorts of books a book you take into the kitchen with you. I always think there's a certain kind of book. If you take it into the kitchen with you, then you know you've got a page turner. Um, and this is, I think, a, a kitchen book 
so yeah, it's uh, it might sound heavy going with all the incel um, factor and what have you, but it is actually a proper proper page turner. Can't put it down there. So yes, I would like to say that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so Lisa, give us your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs and order the book. Yeah, so I am lisajewelbooks.com. I'm uh, Lisa Jewel UK on Twitter and on Instagram and Lisa Jewel on, uh, I have a page on Facebook as well. So th those are the places that you can find me. There you go. It's a number, she's a number one New York Times bestselling author. Thanks for being on the show, Lisa. We certainly appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed our chat. It's been fantastic. I have as well. It's been wonderful to have you on. I'm sure our readers will really enjoy digging into the, your latest book and also your library. They should dig into that as well. Yeah, good backlist. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so check it out, guys. Uh, you can go to Amazon or wherever you get fine books are sold and order up uh, Lisa's book, Invisible Girl. And it sounds definitely uh, interesting, exciting, and suspenseful. So you want to check it out. Uh, you can also see the video version of this on YouTube.com. For Chess Chris Voss, hit that bell notification button. It's free for an unlimited time. You want to grab it while that uh, offer is still available. Uh, you can also go to Goodreads.com. For Chess Chris Voss, uh, follow me over there uh also facebook.com the chris voss show on facebook and there's a bunch of groups there too as well on the on top of the page um and i think that's about everything dcvpn.com refer to your friends show uh, relatives neighbors dogs cats everybody get them listen to the show thanks for tuning into my audience uh, thanks to everyone for being here stay safe we'll see you next time